Okay, well, it's, uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Shelley Moore. Shelley is a scientist with the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, also known as SQURP, in Costa Mesa. She joined SQURP in 1994 after earning her bachelor's degree in marine biology and a master's degree in biology, both from California State University, Long Beach. I actually met Shelley at Cal State Long Beach. Um, she was my biostats TA. <laughs> um, and then again, I worked at part-time at Squirp, and so then I met her again. Um, and then, since then, we've been friends. Um, and um, her and I, we also serve on the Southern California Academy of Sciences Board of Directors. And so um, Shelley's a dear friend of mine, and I'm really excited to hear her talk tonight. Um, she's currently leading regional studies as part of the Southern California BITE Regional Monitoring Program to examine trash in rivers and streams and in the ocean. She is also working on a project in partnership with the Ocean Protection Council, State Water Re Resources Control Board, and the San Francisco Estuary Institute to develop and evaluate monitoring methods for trash in our rivers and streams. The title of tonight's talk is, There is Great Future in Plastics, So What's the Big and Little Deal? Please help me welcome my dear friend, Shelley Moore. <laughs> All right, where's the, right there we go. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, one of the things I'm going to talk about is a lot of the work that we've done at SCORP looking at both macro debris and microplastics. And the microplastics are, are really starting to become a hot uh, topic. And I'll tell you about some of the stuff that we've done just this week uh, to progress the studies um, around microplastics. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about macro debris in the beginning, and then I'll transition over to uh, microplastics. There's a lot of places that you can find debris in the ocean. Um, you can find it on the ocean bottom. You can find it in the water column. You can find it on the beaches. So we've, we've, we've done a lot of studies looking at each one of those habitats. We've also gone upstream to look at uh, debris in rivers as well. The types and amounts of debris vary depending on where you're looking at it. So what, we have, what have we done with macro debris? We did a study back in 1998, and I know this is an old study, but I like to, to, to revisit it because it was one of the first studies that was done on a regional scale. Most of the study, studies you see people do are one-shot things where they, they go out, they have an area of concern, they, they look at that area, they study the trash in that one area. This was actually a larger study that was done on all beaches in Orange County. We would walk a 25-yard segment of beach from high tide all the way back to the, the first barrier, and we counted every single piece of trash that we found. Additionally, we thought we would look to see if we were missing anything. So we sieved a, a five-gallon bucket of sand to see if we, were, we, we could find something that perhaps people weren't seeing. This is what we found. Our sample design allowed us to estimate and extrapolate how much debris was on beaches in Orange County. We estimated there were over 105 million of those plastic pellets, the nurdles, that you guys probably have heard about. Um, the, the top um, item we found were those uh, form, foamed plastics and hard plastics. So you can see plastics were very prevalent in the list. So one of the other things that we did that was kind of cool is we actually, where there was a brand name on the trash item, we looked to see what it was. So I wanted to kind of have you guys guess at what you think were the top items in each category. So what do you think was the top cigarette? Marlboro. How about the candy? I actually heard somebody say the answer. Starburst. <laughs> Fast food. You would think. We thought it would for sure be McDonald's. But if you think about the fast food places in Orange County, no, it was back in 1998. So Jack in the Box. How about beer? Uh, Bud Light. <laughs> How about drink? Drink products. Coca-Cola. Coca yep. 
You guys did pretty good. So overall, we, we looked at all the, the different brands, and these were what we uh, came up with. So you can see there was a w pretty wide variety of things that people were finding, with those on the, on the other side being the, the top items. So recently, trash has really become a big topic, uh, particularly throughout California. We've had a lot of bans recently, the, the statewide ban on bags. Uh, before that, we had local bans on bags, LA County, some of the cities. Um, we are also now uh, have to ask for straws, things like that. The state has done a number of things to try to control the amounts of trash getting out into the environment. One of those things was a total maximum daily load, which essentially required the areas that had a TMDL for trash to uh, try to um, cut back on the amounts of trash that went in. The most famous one that many of you might have heard about was the LA River TMDL. And basically the target for the LA River was zero, which caused a lot of controversy. Most recently, the State Water Board has passed what they call the trash amendments. And that requires uh, municipalities to either go down one of two paths. The first path, they um, put in full capture devices, and I'll show you some pictures of some full capture devices later on in my presentation. If they do that, they're golden. That's all they have to do. They don't have to do anything else. Those full capture devices are thought, thought to take care of all the trash that go into the rivers and streams. The second path they can go, and, and it's all dependent usually on what amount of resources that, that the state has. The second path basically allows them to do um, expanded street sweeping or education, some other form of um, trash capture. What comes along with going down that, that second path is that they also are required to do some monitoring. So one of the other projects that uh, we've been working on, we've been working on this project for a very long time. Uh, about every five years, we have some regional monitoring that happens. Basically, the regional monitoring happens from point conception all the way down to the U.S.-Mexico border. And we do trawls. Mostly we do the trawls to catch fish and invertebrates. We want to make sure that the communities of fish and inverts are what they should be, not being impacted by any type of pollution. When we do that, we also collect debris. So one of the things we've been doing is tracking that debris. We also, as part of the BITE program, have been doing a regional stream survey. And I'm going to show you some results from both of those um, projects. Our stream survey, or, or our riverine study, um, we did in 2013. We did 273 sites from point conception all the way down to U.S.-Mexico border, all those counties. If you walk into a river or stream and you walk 100 feet, you have 100%, essentially 100% chance of finding a piece of trash. Most of the trash, of course, was plastic. And what we did was we actually compared it with some GIS layers. We looked at some maps and we found that you were likely to find higher amounts of trash in the river or stream if it was close to a road and if it was a large road in particular. For that stream survey, these are the top 10 items that we found. Again, plastic is a big culprit. One of the odd things that I've witnessed myself is that uh, we find an extremely large amount of sports balls in the rivers and streams. One of the things we wanted to do with this data that we collected was see if there was um, any effectiveness of policy. One of the questions I hear from managers all the time is that we're passing all these policies regarding trash. Is it actually being effective? We have no way of looking at whether or not it's been effective. So we took that rivering data and we looked at plastic bags found in areas with bans versus without bans. Remember, this was done in 2013. It was before the statewide ban. So we had mostly um, local munis municipalities and ci cities that had passed uh, the bans. What we found was that there was about a three to one ratio uh, in areas uh, without bands versus with bands of plastic bags. So it does seem to be working. We've, we've repeated this uh, survey last summer, so we should be looking and, and seeing if the statewide ban has had an impact at that point. Remember I said we did trawls um, in the regional bite survey. Uh, we've done those trawls since 1994. And 
the goal was, as I said, to look at fish and invertebrate uh, communities, but we also looked at debris. And this is one of the few studies that we have some trend data for. And what you can see is that other than the anomal nominal year in 2003, there appears to be an upward trend in trash off of our coast. Better way of reading this graph is to look at it and say, for instance, in 1994, it's at about 15%. What that means is if you go offshore and you do a 10 minute trawl on the bottom of the ocean, anywhere in the bite, you have about a 15% chance of pulling up a piece of trash in that trawl. Now that percent is over 20%. I'm currently working on a study uh, looking at uh, methods. Remember when I described those full capture devices versus the non-full capture devices and people were going to be required to monitor? Well, now they need some monitoring methods because they don't know how to go out there and, and look at the trash right now. These are some of those full capture devices. The one in the upper left is something that was installed in the city of San Jose. It's about two stories underground. Stormwater goes through that, all the trash drops to the bottom. That's considered a full capture device. On the bottom, you've probably all seen those grates. Those are considered full capture. When we say full capture, it means that they're collecting all the trash, or they're stopping all the trash from going into the rivers and streams that's greater than five millimeters. The street sweeping and the uh, low impact development are both partial capture, so that people who use that, municipalities that use that, would have to do some sort of monitoring. So we've got this project that was funded by the California Ocean Protection Council in partnership with the, the State Water um, Resources Control Board. Um, I'm working with the folks up in the San Francisco area and we're developing some methods. We're gonna put, in, put those into a playbook and um, distribute that to all those folks that have to do the monitoring. Some of the stuff that we're doing is we're making sure that those, those uh, methods are accurate, they're repeatable by different groups, we want to make sure that they're usable by different groups. So if you're a citizen monitor, you can use one of those methods uh, versus somebody who actually, um, ha um, it's part of their job going out and doing that. The, we're testing some different methods. Um, those methods are a qualitative method where we go out, we walk a 100 foot stretch of, of the river and we give it a score between one and 12 with 12 being the highest. Um, based on the amounts of trash that we see in the area. We also do a volumetric uh, uh, assessment and a count assessment. We've got a lot of data where we've taken counts of the items within that stretch of river, um, and most of the time it's hard plastic pieces, or some form of plastic that's mo most often found. One of the cool things that we're doing is we're trying to develop some new methods for assessing trash in the environment, and one of those is using drones. I'm gonna show you a little bit about that in just a minute. So um, again, we're, we're looking at the method repeatability. How much error is it? How close to the truth do we come to um, picking up all the trash in the system? We're doing it both in creeks and, and rivers and also in wetland areas. And we're using drones to do that. I'm gonna play a video real quick to show you one of the drone flights. Um, here it is, this is in San Francisco Bay. So that, that drone is being um, taken up to about 100 feet. It flies a certain area and collects all the imagery. We bring it back to the lab and I'll show you some of the analysis that we have for it. I um, have another video. Basically, whenever you fly the drone, you can also create sort of a virtual reality um, um, product. And this video should be flying into that river and, and showing you all of, all of what's there. What's really great about using the drone is that you can do things like take people to places that they've never been before and show them areas that they might not be able to get out to. Um, and it becomes our eye in the sky. So one of the things we've been doing is flying it to look at trash. In this picture, it's a drone shot looking down on a vegetated area and those green marks identify where there is trash. And right now we're in the phase where we have a human looking at all the images and marking the trash by hand. So that's our training set. Once, once a bunch of those images are, are, um, are marked, 
then we can put those through a computer program and the computer program will start recognizing the trash. And then after we've trained the computer to do that, the computer can then analyze the images. So I'm going to zone, zoom into a particular area here and show you what the trash actually looks like. And, and these are what the, f the folks who are looking at the images are marking. You can see there's a few things that are identifiable. You've got a, a child's toy here, a water bottle up here, some different types of wrappers there. What we're hoping to be able to do is to say trash or not trash. Once we can do that, we want to be able to, um, we're going to work on being able to identify plastic versus not plastic versus unknown. So we're, we're, we're doing a lot of work collecting the images and processing them. One of the things we did for that site was we actually walked that site and counted all the trash to make a comparison with what we were seeing with the drone. If we just compare the two, um, the two methods, you see a pretty big difference. With, with walking the area, you find a lot more trash than with the drone. But if you take out the small pieces, and the pieces of paper that were in that site, the numbers get a little bit closer. Well, so basically, that's what that's telling us is we're not seeing all of the trash in the drone imagery. imagery. It doesn't mean that we can't do something to um, alleviate that problem. Again, we fly it at about 100 feet. So what we're trying to do now is bring the drone down a little bit so we get better resolution. We're also working, the California Department of Health uh, has a tobacco tr control pro program and they've asked us to develop some methods at looking at tobacco waste. So we're exploring ways of using the drone to do that as well. You can see there on the right, um, it's a, a, we're, we're zoomed into an area in this drone imagery, and we planted some uh, wrappers, some tobacco wrappers, and some cigarette buds. So what have we been doing with uh, microplastics? Uh, microplastics are an interesting thing because there's a lot of people working on them right now. But there's a problem with that, and I'll explain that in a minute. One of the problems is that there's a whole bunch of definitions of sizes. Everything that I'm going to show you that we've worked on so far is in this large microplastic category from one millimeter to five millimeter. Most of the concern is coming around the small microplastics right now. They're finding microplastics in almost everything. So we did a study back in 2009. Because of that 1998 study where we identified all those pre-production plastic pellets on the beaches in Orange County, the State Water Board wanted to look at beaches throughout California, and in particular look at the nurdles. So this gives a little bit of information about them. They're, they're on the, the larger side for microplastics again. Um, they come from a variety of different sources, uh, mostly in the transport of those pre-production plastic pallets to uh, other um, areas, other factories, because those pe uh, plastic pellets get sent to other factories where they make them into the actual products that they're going to become, such as toys and um, plastic items that you might have uh, relative to food. We had 60 sites for that particular study, roughly 30 in Northern California and 30 in Southern California. We did three areas of the beach. We did the rack line, mid beach, and first barrier, where we took our samples. These were all randomly chosen samples throughout the state. And this is basically what we found. We, we found a huge number right here off of Los Angeles and Orange County. Um, and when we thought about that, we thought, well, I wonder why that is. What we did back then was we had a, did have a map of where all the plastics manufacturers were. <laughs> and they're right in that area. They tend to move around quite a bit, or at least they did back then. Um, so they, that's why the map is from 2007. But I guarantee you, even though they're moving around, they're all still in that general area. One of the other studies we did was part of that regional bite survey where uh, we have folks go out and they send these big, huge cranes down to the bottom of the ocean and they pick up sediment and the, they're looking at the sediment to look at the critters in the sediment to see if there's any impacts on them. But they're also starting to find microplastics. And for 2013, we asked if they would 
pool the microplastics for us so we could look at how prevalent they were off our coast. So the way you want to read this is it's about 35% right here. If you go out in the ocean anywhere in the bite and you send that crane down to get a sediment sample, you have about a 35% chance of finding at least one piece of plastic in that grab. When you go into the embayments, particularly ports, marinas, and bays, it goes way up, even over 80% in ports. So if you go out in the port here and do a random uh, grab, you've got an 80% chance of having at least one piece of, of microplastic in that sample. And again, these are one to five millimeters. So we know we're finding the microplastics, particularly in the large sizes. We know that they, they're uh, having some effect on our environment. There is some contamination. Where are all these microfibers coming from? Well, there's a number of sources. There's been a lot of press around them coming through our wastewater treatment plants. There's been a lot of press about uh, them in our drinking water, those kinds of things. Um, and they're all over the place. I was in Denver last week for a conference, a monitoring conference, and I took a tour of their air monitoring station in the city of Denver, and they're finding microplastics falling out of the air. Not just there, but they also have a station in the Rocky Mountains, and they're finding microplastics in the air in the Rocky Mountains as well. So there's a whole bunch of different areas that we're finding mic microplastics at this time. Where are they coming from? Some of them come from the clothing that you're wearing, as Ed said beforehand. Some of them are breakdown products of larger items. Tire dust is a big problem as well. Uh, bags, all kinds of things, they break down into smaller um, sizes and they remain in the environment. Some of the things we look at when we're looking at microplastics, we want to know what polymer type is because if there's a particular one that's out there that's prevalent, we, we're looking at, looking at what the sources of that are. A lot of them have different additives to make them stronger or weaker, depending on what type of product that they're going to be made into. Lots of different product types are out there. Um, those pre-production plastic pellets, all the way down to those larger items that uh, break down. We also see a lot of different colors of microplastics. What's interesting is the, the gentleman from Denver who told us about the stuff falling out of the air said, in particular, they're finding these blue flat fibers. And when we asked him what he thought it was, he had no idea, but he said, who doesn't own a blue tarp? That perhaps it was coming from there. Talking with uh, experts just recently, um, I told them about the blue fibers and they believe they might be from blue jeans. So we don't, we don't know for sure just yet. There's, there's uh, some problems with the methods they're still working out. This is actual cover of a Life magazine back from 1955 when plastics were thought to be the most amazing thing. They were going to make life so much simpler for everybody. And you can see how excited this family is. But in reality, plastics are a problem. You can see that 8,300 million metric tons are produced. Less than half um, is discarded, or around half is discarded, a little more. But you can see what low numbers are actually recycled and go through secondary use. So most of it's going out and being um, discarded into landfills or into the environment. When we're talking about the environment, we're talking about a lot of different places that you're finding microplastics in the ocean, um, even in, in polar ice. Some folks have gone through and looked at all the literature that's out right now, and over 220 species have been affected by microplastics. They've found them in birds, turtles, all kinds of different organisms, even copepods. <laughs> all kinds of things, but now they're actually finding them in our food. Table salt, in particular, some of our seafood, 
<laughs> one of the things we were just talking about, and I'll go into this a little bit more about what, what the problems are with, with my, uh, looking at microplastics. Some folks were using table salt to analyze their microplastic, an analyze samples for microplastics. And they didn't realize that there were microplastics in the salt. So they had to redo their samples. Again, it's in drinking water. I've seen a report that they've found microplastics, oh my gosh, in beer, which, you know, who wants microplastics in their beer? <laughs> they've also found microplastics in human stool, too. So it's, it's, we're eating it. We just, we just don't realize it. There's other things that are going on with the microplastics. There's contaminants that it hit, absorb to the microplastics and can be released when you consume those microplastics and get into your tissues. So some of the next big questions that we have, you can see we don't, we don't have a lot of knowledge about the effects of the microplastics on the marine organisms, on humans. Um, almost anything, we don't know what the effect is because they're small and we're just realizing that they're there right now. But you see on the bottom there, it says improved methods for quantifying, characterizing microplastics in complex matrices. The biggest problem with uh, studying microplastics, there's tons of studies going on, but they're all doing different methods. They're not doing anything consistently. So when you compare, want to compare those results, you can't do the comparison. They're all looking at different sizes. They're all using different methods. Everything is um, different. One of the big questions we get is how much contamination is out there? Again, without the methods to look at it at, on a big picture level, level you're not going to know. Also, we want to know what the risk is, risk to human health. So if we choose to do nothing about plastics, it's going to grow really fast. If we choose to do something, we can bring it down. Again, I said there's been tons of publications around microplastics. We have not added 2018 to this uh, graph, but it would probably go off this, this page. Recent legislation in California has attempted to deal with my microplastics. They can no longer use microbeads in personal care products. One of the studies that w has been done on wastewater treatment plants for LA County, um, they, they were finding a ton of these little blue microbeads. Can anybody guess what those were from? Facial scrubs. Facial scrubs. They think they were actually from toothpaste. <laughs> Have you ever had the toothpaste with the little blue, yeah. blue dots in them? So most recently, just at the end of last year, we had two pieces of legislation passed. One, dealing with drinking water. They're finding microplastics in drinking water, so the state is required by law now to develop standardized methods at looking at microplastics in drinking water. Eventually, once they've, dis they've developed the standardized methods, they'll have to set a, a threshold for how much is allowable in drinking water. <laughs> Additionally, uh, we've had some legislation passed that requires the California Ocean Protection Council to write a document called the um, Statewide Microplastic Strategy, with, which identifies all the gaps in the knowledge around microplastics. It also gives them the authority to pay for research to give us information on those gaps. I have I raced out here this afternoon. For the last two days, we've had a microplastics workshop surrounding methods to get those methods standardized um, in Costa Mesa. We flew in people from all over the world, experts in microplastics. We sat down today to develop a study plan. We sat down with the Ocean Protection Council, with the State Water Resources Control Board, all the experts to write a study plan to move forward towards standardizing the methodologies. So there's a lot of work being done in this area. That's it for my presentation. Uh, you can find out more information through my company's website. We have a lot of our, our papers, our, our journal articles, and, and research on that website. You can also feel free to contact me 
um, through email. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Sorry. I was instructed to turn the lights on. Turn the lights on. Turn the lights on. <laughs> okay, is that good enough? You want more? Yay! Which many of you may have realized, we actually film these lectures and post them on our website. And I have been negligent to turning up the lights at the end to the questions. So I was instructed to get those lights on tonight. So I just got the clue from the videographer back there. She can see, she can see me. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for an incredible presentation. We have You're a welcome. small gift for you. Thank you. There you go. Thanks. And we'd like to open it up for you. I, no, notice the canvas, not plastic. Yay. 1992 vintage. What? No, that one's still in my car. You're not getting that one. Like to open up some questions. If anybody has some questions to Shelley. Dr. Moore. Yeah, California is doing a lot to control the plastic situation. What is the world doing about it? <laughs> It's interesting you should say that because I was in Denver last week, but I also went to New Jersey. I was, I was invited to go to a workshop they were putting on about microplastics. And their comment consistently was, we're glad you're here because California is always ahead of what everybody else is doing. So they're, they, we are, we are. And so they're looking on the other coast at, at controlling some of this stuff. They're doing a lot of work in Europe. We had speakers at the workshop these last two days from Norway, Germany, uh, Canada. Um, they're all very concerned about uh, microplastics, particularly in wastewater that are ge that's getting out into the environment, as well as drinking water. And they're, they've, they're all studying it. Not necessarily having the legislation pa passed like we do. We're pretty pro progressive that way. But they're, they are looking at it. Yes, I would like to know. Is there any kind of uh, organization or focus to try and get plastics out of the stores, for instance, as an example? When I buy bearings at the supermarket, I want bearings. They're good for me. But they're in these plastic cartons, and they used to be in paper. Can't we go back to that? <laughs> I wish. I remember those times when they were in paper. I also remember those times when they put uh, milk on your porch in glass bottles. <laughs> I hate to admit that, but I do. And, and it's, what it's going to take is, it, it, and one of the things we discussed at this workshop in uh, New Jersey was it has to do with costs. If we make it worth their while to put it back in paper, then they'll, they'll do it. But until we get to that point, they won't. Um, it, we had an interesting speaker that um, runs a company that tries to recycle everything, all waste. Um, and he basically had a can of Coke in his hand, and he said, this is, this, is my, this is a vote. Even though I don't want to vote, this is a vote for this type of product. I try to avoid it as much as I can, but it's really hard. It's really hard not to use single-use plastics in this world. It's really hard not to use things that are, are single-use products that go into um, the waste stream. Um, but every time we do that, we vote for that product and, and support it. So it's going to have to take a whole bunch of people um, not voting for those products to make the change. And hopefully we can do that sooner rather than later. So when you said it's 35% at the seafloor is microplastics and then it goes up to like 80%? In the ports. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the future like for that plastic to go to the seafloor? I mean, what would the future be like if nothing happened? So... The, the thing we don't know about the plastic we're finding in the, in the sediment in the ocean is we don't know how long, how long it's been there. You remember the, in the 50s is when plastic started to be really prevalent. So we don't know if it's been there since the 50s. We don't know if it was just recently deposited. Um, so some work needs to be done in that. But unless, things, unless the contribution stops, it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing. Um, and the ocean has no way to deal with it. The ocean doesn't. No, as a matter of fact, most plastics um, degrade faster in sunlight and through air exposure. In the colder ocean, they degrade slower. So they're going to be around for a lot longer. 
Then shouldn't we also be putting efforts into cleaning up the oceans in addition to preventative measures? Is, are there any steps we've taken in those regards? Yeah, so there's there's a young gentleman by the name of Boyan Slot. Uh, he's been uh, he's had a lot of press. He's got these big um, engineered buoys that are supposed to go out in the ocean and collect the um, the microplastics in the trash, um, with the thought that we should be cleaning up the um, the environment. He's had a lot of criticism. I don't think the the um, thing he created has been working real well. Um, but the criticism has been, it's a, it, it, there's a, it's a large pro problem. Why not start at the sources and stop the stuff from getting out there, and then we can start thinking about cleaning it up. So that's a great question. Sure. Has there been any kind of a, uh, chemical analysis on how the water quality has changed chemically since the high amount of plastics that are in our environment versus what it should be? Yeah, so we, we do some chemical analysis on the water. We, we're, we look at the water quality, and there are chemicals from different things that are going out there. Um, they get absorbed to the plastic. Um, so we know what's out there. We don't know how much is getting attached to the plastic, how much is being released. That's the next step, basically, as we develop the methods for looking at them. Yeah. Are you guys looking into bacteria at all? Because there is bacteria that can yes. metabolize this plastic. And you said there's regulation methods going in. So are you starting to research bacteria that can metabolize this? Yes, so I'm not doing that research right now, but there's a lot of people looking at biofilms on uh, microplastics. So, yeah. You talk a lot about plastic. What about metals? Have you like done any research on the metals? We have not done a lot of research on the metals. I mean, we look for the, the, tr the traces of metals in the water, um, but we, we're not studying the, the metal trash, per se, um, and looking at it. There is some metal trash, but right now it's just overwhelmed by all the plastic. So. Sure, way in the back. Yeah. Uh We've, we've had a lot of rain this, this year, and, uh, you know, everybody's been talking about storm water runoff and everything. Couldn't that contribute if we, if we actually collected that? And, and what possibly could you do to, to uh, treat that storm water runoff? Is there, you know, I mean, there's, there's one thing about keeping it out of the ocean, and then the second thing about maybe handling it. Yeah, so there's been a lot of effort. You saw the, the, the trash policies by the State Water Board to control the large amounts, large trash from getting out there. Um, but it still gets out there, even though people put, you know, they, they put those full capture devices on, but you've got homeless people living in the rivers and streams, you've got wind-blown litter, um, people tossing things in there. Um, so there's still a lot of litter that's getting into those areas. Um, and a lot of effort is made to clean those areas up. Uh, I took some folks out earlier this week to a particular area that I don't think a lot of people know about. Um, there was so much trash in that area locally. Um, it was described to me as, wow, this is kind of post-apocalyptic looking. It was, it was really bad. And I think once we can get some people going out into some of those areas, and, and picking up the trash, that it'll have a bigger impact on, on what we're doing. I, you saw the, the um, press uh, probably of Seal Beach after the last storm, and I was racking my brain because we had gone looking for trash after that, before that storm, and we weren't finding it in the cement channels. So my thought was that that particular trash came from much, much farther up in the watershed and hadn't been pushed down yet by any of the storms because they were much smaller. And it took that, lo that large, large storm to push everything out from farther up in the watershed all the way down to the beach. Uh, your survey of the MPAs, do you find that helps at all as far as plastics? Does the Indian areas in MPA? We, we haven't uh, done a lot in MPAs. Um, some of our sites do fall in those. Um, it, 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 really depends on how close they are to urban areas and how much fishing, well, not, not fishing, but how much activity, boating activity is going on around those areas, um, but mostly around the urban activity.
the urban um, populations. I don't see a trend of them getting cleaner though. We haven't, we haven't got any trend data on that yet. Yeah. There's somebody yeah, over there? In the back. You got one. We have been recently sending shiploads of plastic to China for them to recycle it. Uh, what, and they all of a sudden decided not to accept even more. Do you know what, what's, the, what's going to happen to that plastic now? <laughs> yeah. It's a good question. Um, there was a, a presentation uh, I saw in New Jersey about that specifically. And, and the reason why they're not taking it anymore is because we send them dirty recyclables. People aren't real good at sorting the recyclables the way they, they need to be sorted. And so they, they were tired of, of having to do that on their end. Um, so we have to get better about doing that. Um, but right now it's kind of in a, in a flux area where we're not, I, there's not a lot being said about what's gonna be done. But we have to get better about recycling our own stuff here in the US. Okay, a couple more. Let me grab that one and sure. that one. Um, with your, with like the statewide legislations and I think you said earlier the, the partial captures would have to do monitoring and then maybe some sort of like education outreach component. Mm -hmm. Is there like any talk about the statewide legislation to just have more education on this mm -hmm. like for curriculum, like you know, starting in elementary school all the way up for the whole state? Yeah, there isn't any legislation that I know of that's currently being talked about in that area. Um, we do, with our project that we're doing, the method evaluations, part of that um, project involves doing outreach. Uh, we also recently got a contract, I was talking about the tobacco control program. Most of that project, after we've developed the, um, the method for looking at tobacco waste, most of that project has to do with um, outreach to uh, different community groups and that kind of stuff. So there is a lot of that going on with projects. They'll, they'll require that as part of the project. Sure. Uh, are there any significant categories of plastics that have declined in their prevalence and do we know why? Um, what, I mean, Danny, you might know this answer. Um, you know, the, the Hollywood industry used to dump all, a lot of film, plastic film, off our coast. And so they would, we, we've always had that as a category on our, our data sheets. And I think we just recently got rid of it. Do you remember seeing that? No. Yeah, so we used to get a lot of film, those kinds of things. Um, the pull tabs on the cans, we used to get those as well. We took those off the sheets because we're not getting those. Um, we did add a new category, the single-use container, because they were starting to see a lot of those. Okay. So we're changing our, our sheets as we go along and seeing different things. I'd like to jump in here real quick. So we're not done. We're just going to relocate. We're going to go up to the gift shop. Shelly, Dr. Moore is going to join us. See, I, I don't know who's Dr. Moore. For me, she's Shelly. Is going to go to the gift shop, and we're going to get some more dirt or some uh, decaf coffee and cookies. We can continue this conversation. But I wanted to share some solution-based things that I was hearing. So you asked about the strawberry and the plastic containers. So the aquarium also works in the climate change education arena. And a lot of the solutions are outside of the individual control. A lot of it has to come from corporate levels. So we have to make our demands known at that level. So over the weekend, I bought my first bamboo toothbrush. I didn't even <laughs> know they made those things. So I also bought toothbrushes that are made out of recycled toothbrushes for my grandkids. They're out there. Start buying them, and as Shelly said, the industry will start paying attention with that Coke can, and they will sell you what you want to buy. Yeah. So it has to come at that level. Or make a big bunch of stink at the legislation level and get the laws passed. Why we don't have single-use plastic bags anymore? Because it's legislative driven and it's happening. So there's that. Also, I want to give a preliminary advertisement. We're working on an exhibit, a temp exhibit on plastic. And you know who's working on it. <laughs> no pressure. Um, so we're going to soon have a new temporary exhibit on plastic pollution. Dr. Moore and Julie are working on it right now. And last, I heard about education. I forgot to announce this. We're in our middle of our spring program right now at the aquarium. Thousand kids a day. 
And one of the stations the kids go to is a pollution station. We're getting the youngins. Because there's research says if you can get the youngins to do the guilt trips on their parents, you will. <laughs> yes. There is research to that level. We all know, Dad, why didn't you? Okay. So we're working on that a thousand kids a day.